Okay, so moving on then in the next little uh, subsection here, subchapter of Toynbee's uh, study of history. And uh, here we are looking at a map. He moves on to India. So what he's doing is going from west to east, uh, commenting on the living or analyzing the living civilizations and then going back to see if, if they are uh, themselves affiliated societies uh, to a mother uh, civilization. And we have seen uh, what has happened with Islamic society as the result of a fusion between Iranic Islam on the one hand and then Arabic Islam on the other, and that both were um, affiliated back to the Syriac society. And um, <clears throat> here we're going to look at <clears throat> the Indic society. Um, he calls it Indic rather than Indian. Spengler calls it Indian. I'm not sure why he calls it Indic. Um, so he starts with Likewise, he says, so we have modern-day Hindu society. Um, let's go back and see if there was ever a universal state, a universal church, and a Fulker Vandaram. And he says, when we go back as far as uh, the Gupta, the period of the Gupta Empire, uh, which is to say, going back to um, 319 to 467 AD, uh, it wasn't very long-lived. Uh, and this is the extent that it covered, which is mostly... Uh, from northwest to northeast India here. Its capital was Pataliputra. And uh, he says, okay, so we have a universal state here. Was there a universal church? And he says, absurdly, that Hinduism is the universal church uh, of this universal state. Uh, so we do find those two structures in place. And we even find a Fulker Vandaram in that uh, there are waves of barbarian invaders who come in, the Hunas uh, and the uh, Gurjaras, uh, they all come in right about 750 A.D. and uh, knock this thing out. And then for three centuries, all the way down uh, to, or from uh, 450 down to 775, we have this sort of barbarian interregnum, which is also absurd because this is the period. Uh, and this becomes a problem for both Spengler and Toynbee with regard to India. India's art. India's art is at its apogee in the Gupta period. Um, and even in the period of the Fulker of Andurang, uh, of the barbarians from uh, 450 to 775, um, and then with the birth of a new society, what he calls Hindu society in 775, with uh, the regional societies that come in with the Pala dynasty and the Rastrakuta uh, dynasty and so forth. Um, the art through this entire phase, and even before the Gupta, um, has been getting better and better and better. It climaxes in the Gupta dynasty, which is supposed to be a period of decline. A universal state uh, would normally be associated with, with a decline of the art. It's, it's not in decline. And it's not even in decline during that intervening period there of the barbarians who, who come in, the Gurjaras, um, in this middle period here, which lasts from uh, 450 all the way to, actually all the way to 1036, uh, the Hunas come in 450 to 528 and the Gujaras 750 to 1036 and the art is though it's not quite as good as the Gupta art let's take a look at Gupta art uh, here's a Wikipedia page on it um, this is uh, Indian art at its finest it's sculpture anyway um, this is Vishnu in his avatar form as the boar Faraha rescuing the goddess who has been kidnapped by an elephant demon from the depths of the ocean and he is on his way carrying her up to the surface with his tusks where she will become the earth. Um, <clears throat> here's one of my favorites, one of the most beautiful sculpture uh, sculpture pieces found in India. This is Vishnu asleep and dreaming the cosmic world dream. Um, his Shakti, his consort, is stimulating the dream over here by rubbing his foot. And that stimulates the dream. Uh, she is the Shakti energy that powers the whole thing, the electricity, let's say, of the universe. These are the Pandava brothers down here with their single wife Draupadi that they all shared in common. Uh, I wonder how that went. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we have Brahma arising uh, from the, supposedly from the navel, but it's probably not considered good form to represent that. Um, Brahma with his four faces, then sending out the light of radiance of waking consciousness in, into the world. But it's waking our waking within Vishnu's dream. Our life is part of Vishnu's dream. Um, and then some other great art. This is uh, the three-faced uh, Shiva. And then uh, here we have the boar again. Um, lots of great art from the Gupta period. 
Um, absolutely spectacular. Now, uh, the art continues. So this is the, what Toynbee says is the universal state. And then there's this breakup period. And then when it, the society reconstitutes itself uh, in 775, we have the Pala Empire over here, the Rastrakuta Empire over here. Uh, the Pratiharas are still are still going, and Pala art is almost as good, but not as not quite as as good as Gupta art. And it's exactly the same same kind of art uh, here: are the Palas, the Rastrakutas, and the Gurjara Pratiharas uh, from this period that he says represents the birth of a separate society from the Indic society, which goes from 1500 BC all the way then down to. Um, to 775 and then the new society 775 to the present day which is his time frame of course is in the 1930s when he's writing this and so this is Pala art that's going on here um, the architecture is still quite beautiful uh, the sculpture is stiffening up a bit uh, but it's still quite good very beautiful stuff here uh, with these forms and here once again is this is all the way in the different society, Toynbee says, of Hindu society versus uh, Indic society. We have Varaha, again, the boar. Same myths, same gods, same deities, right down the line from day one to the end of this civilization. These are not two societies, and that, that's a big problem uh, for Toynbee. So he says then, but, uh, so Spangler says... Um, this is the Maurya dynasty, which comes in 265. It's founded by Chandragupta Maurya, who is the father. He, he only runs it for about a year before he dies. Of, he's the father of Ashoka, whom Spengler says is the first of the Caesars. Um, he creates what Toynbee would call a universal state. Spengler simply calls it the time of the Caesars. Um, and this is it. This is the largest empire ever created in India, where it even included the Hindu Kush and almost all of the south. We've seen that the Gupta only was in, in about this region here. It was nowhere near as large. So this is India's first universal state with its first Caesar figure, Ashoka, who convert, converts to Buddhism. Buddhism, therefore, is the universal church, not Hinduism. Buddhism would be the universal church for this universal state, whereas Hinduism uh, runs right alongside of it continuously. It is, it is in no way, shape, or form uh, a different religion in the Hindu society from 775 to the present. Um, he says they were worshiping these icons, these new figures that are icons that just simply weren't there in the Vedic period. No, they weren't there as statues, is what he means to say. Time he's terrible with art history and the history of philosophy, two subjects about which he knows next to nothing um, that Spangler hasn't beat in, hands down, all the way down the line. Um, there were acoustic icons of pretty much the same gods and goddesses in the Rig Veda, which is the earliest Indian text, sacred book. The Rig Veda dates from about 1500 BC, and it's all hymns to the gods. There are no visual uh, uh, icons, no, but there are acoustic icons, mantras and prayers and so forth that are sent to the gods. So this isn't a different religion. It's just that sculpture has been introduced by the conquests of Alexander the Great, whom he says also very surprisingly... I I was tempted to read this out loud because almost every sentence he says is, is incorrect. He says here, the first step is to make out when the Hellenic intrusion upon India uh, began and ended. <clears throat> we cannot equate its beginning with Alexander's Indian campaign, for this raid, though justly celebrated in military history as a brilliant tour de force, had no effects which have made a mark in the history of culture. Dead, flat out, fucking wrong. <laughs> and, uh, the, India's con contact with Alexander the Great was what introduced them to sculpting in stone. And the sculpture in stone then begins with the Maurya dynasty here, um, <clears throat> shortly after Alexander's conquests, not very, 330 BC, something like that for Alexander. This is 265, and we have its universal state, but also the birth of its art. There, scholars think that there were works of art, obviously, in, existing in India before that, but they were carved in wood. Both the architecture and the sculpture was carved in wood, so none of it survives or remains. But nonetheless, and this is a problem for Spengler too, is that because for, for Spengler then, this is the first of the Caesars and the art should be dying out, but it's just getting going. And it doesn't peak until the Gupta uh, Empire. So really, Spengler's model makes sense on the political plane, doesn't make sense on the artistic plane though. 
uh, where the art is just coming in here. Let's take a look at the art of the Maurya dynasty, where uh, Ashoka had commissioned this wonderful Buddhist temple at Sanchi, um, and it has several phases going over over time. Take a glance at it here. Uh, this is what it looked like, but most of the beautiful art that we associate with it doesn't come in in the time of Ashoka, not until a bit later, about 100 BC, which is uh, the series of the famous reliefs of the uh, Satavahana period, this period right here, 1st century BC to 1st century uh, AD or CE, if you prefer. I, I don't use BCE and CE because there was nothing wrong with BC and AD. There were, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, you know, scholars annoy the shit out of me sometimes with their wanting to uh, deconstruct everything and revise it so they can get tenure. They can write a paper and say they, they claimed they founded this new thing by renaming it, so now uh, I deserve tenure. Uh, it, it's, it's a scam. So the art here uh, is absolutely fantastic, but this is the birth of Indian art. It's still a bit tentative, a bit uh, uh, not certain of itself, a bit primitive, a bit rough hewn. Um, it's nothing like the art of the Gupta period that we looked at here. Uh, it, it's just not on that skill or level of mastery. And this, by the way, is Buddhist art. Ashoka had converted to the Universal Church of Buddhism, um, which was still Hinayana Buddhism, which is monastic Buddhism that rejects the world and renounces it. And it depicts all, a whole bunch of scenes from the life of the Buddha, except that the Buddha is not allowed to himself to be depicted. He would be seated over here, because during this phase of uh, Indian philosophical and religious thinking, the Buddha has attained to nirvana, he's, so he's not there. He's the, the one who has blown out his own soul. He's not there. So he can't be represented in this uh, early art. That changes, of course, by the time Mahayana Buddhism comes along, 100 AD, uh, and we start getting the wonderful Buddhist sculpture, uh, some of which we saw there with uh, in the Gupta period. And so there's, this is beautiful stuff here, uh, but it, it is still a bit sort of pre-classic, uh, let's let's say. So, um, okay, so then we have the Shunga period, 180 BC, that comes in after the Maurya dynasty collapses, and the Greco-Bactrian kingdom that Toynbee uh, was talking about that comes in that governs from 250 to 125 BC and governs the, over the Hindu Kush alongside, and then the Parthians come in. Um, we have them basically from 247 BC, and they last all the way down, though not in India, to, to 224 AD when they're conquered by the Sasanians. Uh, that, that's more Persian than it is Indian history. And then the Kushans come in. Uh, they pretty much rule alongside the Parthians here. Uh, the Kushan dates from about 30 AD to 375. Um, and we have the set of Ahanas. Here they are here, and uh, ruling alongside the Kushans. And the set of Ahana, uh, the area of Sanchi is, is right in this central area of India. Uh, that's why they go in there and, and produce all those reliefs, those beautiful reliefs depicting the life of the Buddha. Here we are back to the Gupta Empire, and you can see that it's nowhere near as large as the extent of the uh, Mauryan Empire. Um, not even close. And then, um, okay, so this is, is this, let's see. Uh, then the Gurjara Pratiharas come in, uh, 750 to 1036 for, for the Gurjara's barbarian peoples. Um, it should be, as, as Toynbee says, it's barbarian peoples, but yet the art is, this is still a very sophisticated cosmopolitan, artistically sophisticated society with a long art cycle that goes all the way down to about the 13th century AD, whereupon it starts descending into kitsch, religious kitsch, and a fixed stock of forms that are repeated. And so uh, I, this is that period, the Pala Empire, Rashtrakuta, and then it goes down to, Tornby says, that's the Hindu society, and it's been the same ever since. Two different societies. It's not two different societies. There's no grounds for that whatsoever. It's just that the universal state that begins with the Maurya period is interrupted by constant peoples coming in from the hinterlands from the northeast, um, or uh, such as the Huns, or from the northwest, such as the Parthians, that keep interrupting India's uh, universal states. But it really would be one continuous universal state all the way pretty much down the line. Um, the only problem then with uh, Spangler's model of it here, and I want to take a look at this before concluding, is that uh, he does not account 
for the art cycle, which is totally different from the cycle that he gives here, which I believe is mostly cor correct, the religious and philosophical, i.e. the metaphysical cycle, where he has <clears throat> uh, at 1500 BC to about 1100, we have the Vedic religion, and that's recorded in the Rig Veda, which is the oldest of all of the texts uh, of India. And we also have Aryan hero tales. Um, I'm sure many of those then turn up in the Mahabharata later on. Um, the earliest mystical metaphysical shaping of a new world outlook, preserved, he says, in some of the oldest parts of the Vedas. Then we get its summer period, as, as it moves from a springtime, rural, intuitive period, great creations of the newly awakened dream-heavy soul, superpersonal unity and fullness, the birth of a myth of the grand style, expressing a new God feeling, world fear, and world longing. Then the summer period, ripening consciousness, earliest urban and critical stirrings. Uh, we get an internal popular opposition to the great springtime forms in India, the Brahmanas, and the oldest parts of the Upanishads, which start ushering in the philosophical phase of Indian uh, metaphysical thinking, which moves from performing rituals, the Brahmin priests pouring butter, melted butter into fire altars and so forth, singing mantras, to actually now thinking philosophically about the implications of these ideas, um, where you don't have to. Yajnavalkya comes along in the oldest of the Upanishads, the Chandogya Upanishad uh, and the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, and introduces, as his name indicates, yoga, which is probably a holdover from an even earlier Indian society that is a separate society, the Harappan slash Dravidian uh, Indus Valley Society that goes back to 2600 BC and lasts for about a thousand years down to 1600 uh, before it is slowly, it, it simply just slowly falls apart. And then the Indo Aryans come in like vultures and uh, over dead bodies and just pick it apart. The beginnings of a purely philosophic form of the world feeling is preserved in the Upanishads, no question about that, where the idea now is to sit in yogic meditation and unite the Atman, the, the micro soul, with Brahman, the macro soul, to fuse them together. <clears throat> uh, we've lost the period of Indian mathematics and whatever Indian uh, Puritan period was, we've lost that. Then we move to the autumn phase when we have the intelligence of the city coming in now and the zenith of a strict intellectual creativeness. Uh, so we have the Enlightenment period, the belief in the almightiness of reason, cult of nature as a reaction against it, uh, rational religion, such as deism, let's say. Um, we have the sutras, and we have Sankhya, the, which is founded at Kapila Vastu uh, by Kapila, <clears throat> the city that's later named after him. I don't know what it was named before. Uh, but Sankhya is the first metaphysical system in India to be non-religious. Uh, and then Buddha goes them one better and says, let's just wipe it all out altogether, all metaphysics, into the void. Nihilism now comes in, uh, and Nirvana replaces Moksha. There is no nothing that corresponds to either Atman or Brahman in Buddhism. Hinayana Buddhism, it's totally nihilistic. Um, and then here we have uh, the Indian development of the number zero, uh, which suits them perfectly with that, that void, that Nirvana. And then the great conclusive systems, which correspond to Plato and Aristotle, uh, and in our case, all the German idealists, uh, Goethe, Kant, Schelling, Hegel, Fichte, the final philosophical fireworks, which would correspond in Islam to Al-Farabi and Avicenna. And last time we looked at the Abbasid Caliphate, which I pointed out was the, the absolute flowering of Islam. And indeed it was. Uh, Spengler agrees with that. He's got Al-Farabi here uh, and Avicenna. Ibn Sina, as he's also known, who was Persian, a great Persian philosopher, and Alpha Rabi, who was from uh, Khorasan and died in Damascus. Um, these are two very great men who were both, they were all, uh, both of them were not only philosophers, but also uh, astronomers and uh, medicine. Uh, they were experts in medicine and mathematics, physics, um, all kinds of stuff, just tight, great minds, just like Goethe and Kant, Plato and Aristotle. And so for that, we have uh, idealism yoga, Vedanta, epistemology, Vaisheshika, and for logic, uh, Nyaya. Um, these are the great conclusive systems. And then it moves into its winter phase, where there's a materialistic world outlook, and we have the cult of science, utility, and prosperity, which is our 19th century shallow philosophers, Bentham, uh, Darwin, Spencer, and so forth. This corresponds again. He's got Sankhya twice. That may be cheating. I'm not sure, but he may mean something, uh, mean it to have different connotations. Um, Lokoyata is a purely materialistic Indian thought system. 
ethical social ideals of life, <clears throat> uh, tendencies in, back in Buddhist time, um, inner completion of the mathematical form moral is lost, degradation of abstract thinking into professional lecture room philosophy. <laughs> that's, that's Spengler's her, uh, arrow that he's hurled at, at uh, the professional philosophy department's compendium literature, such as Kantians, uh, we might even add Jungians um, to this list, uh, school of Baghdad, schools of, of Baghdad and Basra have these tendencies, um, and then the six classical systems of, of Indian thought, and then uh, uh, the spread of a final world sentiment, which comes in at the end with the Indian. Th these are all forms of nihilism: Indian Buddhism, <clears throat> Hellenistic Roman Stoicism, um, fatalist tendencies in Islam from this time, and ethical socialism from 1900 on. Uh, so this works pretty well uh, in terms of the evolution of the mind of India, but he's not taking account of the art. Um, and when he dis the chart that he has for discussing the art, he doesn't include India in there, uh, where the art is just getting going in this in this period here, uh, in the period that would correspond to the first of the Caesars, which, as we have seen, is Ashoka, uh, and the foundations of the universal state of the Mauryan Empire. The art is just getting going, and you could tell by looking at it that it's, it's still kind of... Uh, uh, primitive and, and tentative like a newborn art, which is exactly what it is uh, compared to the later art um, like this magnificent thing. Um, go up to art, you know. Uh, so, if Spengler's model, uh, and, and it, he faces the same problem uh, with respect to China, and Toynbee also makes his own same mistakes that he made in analyzing India in his analysis of China as well. Uh, but both China and India have similar timelines, similar dates. They both get going around 1500 BC. Uh, they both create their first universal states, as we'll see when we look at China next time, uh, about the same time with Ashoka, 2 269 BC, and with Qin Shi Huangdi, 220 BC, roughly at the same time. Their first universal states, which then oscillate back and forth between universal states and then break down, universal state break down. They go all the way down. And the art is also peaking in China at about the same time uh, as the art is peaking in India. Um, so if we revised Spengler's model or um, what he should, let's say what he should have done was make it a 2000 year timeline instead of a 1000 year timeline. Um, India and China are, are exceptions to his general rule uh, that the, um, the pre-culture or at least the, the, the early culture period of a society, as Spengler says, it goes through a pre-culture, an early culture, a late culture, and a civilization phase. Um, the pre-culture period and the culture period, um, that whole thing should be given a 2,000-year arc. Um, and the universal states that come in, in the case of both Toynbee and Spengler, do not feature decadent art like the Romans do, or the Ottoman Empire does, or our American world does. Um, the art is, is, is just getting going there. All right, uh, so that's my analysis of uh, Toynbee's uh, discussion of the two different societies, the Indic society and the Hindu society in his model.